my name is Gadi. I'm a visual artist, as uh, Jimane said. Mm. Uh, with this image, I think, uh, first in, in Tanzania scenario, first you say it, everyone lives there, even if you are not, you are an artist or you're not. So our life is almost inspired by what is happening in, in the social media. And also, uh, it affects it affect some of the things that we are doing usual as a visual artist. For example, how you, uh, you, it's not like you compete, how you collaborate with the, with the technology itself. And also, it had been adaptive, it had been a disease. Uh, that's why sometimes we say it. our parents had been, and they never been, when Win was saying, our parents say sometimes technology is bad, some say technology is bad, some say technology is good, but I think we had never uh, come up to a point of saying let's collaborate or negotiate within within the between the parent and the child. So it's affecting the in the, the sector itself. Yeah, that way we have kick. Yeah, Lo um, all over. Around. Ngaira, what comes into your mind? Okay, um, the very first thing that came to mind is addiction, the addiction and dependency on technology. The image on the far left, yeah. it's, from, it's inspired by a movie called Alien. In Alien, there are these creatures that jump on your face and plants an egg within you. And then later on, the egg hatches and it breaks through and it kills you. So it's, it's sort of like that addiction and dependency. The human depends on technology and, de and technology depends on the human for survival and it can be toxic. Love? Yeah, so echoing the idea that it's about being addicted to technology, but to look at the bigger issue which was also in the last, mentioned in the last panel, which is what choice do we have in relationship to technology? So I think it is important to bear in mind that um, technologies are not uh, neutral, that, uh, and also that they are directed by particular forces. So Facebook is a multinational corporation that makes its money out of using your data by itself or by selling it to other multinational companies. And that um, the idea that technology is kind of self-driving is a powerful idea, but I would say that it's an incorrect idea. Uh, one of the foundational texts that people could read if they're interested is a book called Autonomous Technology by the writer Langdon Winner, which is from the 1980s. It's from the field of science and technology studies. And what science and technology studies asks us to do is to examine the relationship between society and technology. Um, I won't go on for too long, but there's, there's a famous example of the Amish communities in the States, who are religious communities. They always negotiate the use of new technologies. So they decide as a community whether they should have a washing machine or whether they should have a telephone. And for example, with the telephone, initially many Amish communities said they didn't want telephones in their communities. Then they met in some communities and said, no, actually telephones are useful, but we don't want them in the house. We'll make a, a little house at the end of the garden for the phone, and if you want to use the phone, you can go there and use it. So they negotiate their relationship with technology. So I think if we could all cultivate that relationship where it's not about either completely accepting or completely rejecting technology, it's about understanding how we could play an active role in working out what's best for us in our relationship with technology. Rebecca? Uh, hello. Oh, no. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca. I'm the director of Nafasi Art Space. For anyone who doesn't know Nafasi, um, it's a collective and a network um, that supports the development and professionalization of artists um, in Mikochini B. Uh, so we are a, a space um, where more than 50 artists, both visual and performing artists, work on a daily basis um, and exchange and create work. Um, so uh, for me, uh, what I would say, um, you know, artwork, this artwork is a great example um, of the kind of um, visceral storytelling and, and, and impact that um, that artists have an important role to play in, in kind of discussing technology and other, other issues um, that are important to our, our daily lives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, going back to what, uh, what my other co-panelists have said, um, you know, I think um, technology can be used as a weapon, it can be used as a tool um, to control um, 
or, but it can also be used as a tool for expression and creativity, for innovation, um, and for kind of furthering human freedom. Um, so uh, the, the question is really how do, we, how do we use it, how do we interact with it, um, and how do we find ways um, to, make it, uh, to make it a force for good? <laughs> Yeah, so one thing about art, I'm not an artist, I'm an engineer. I, I, I feel like, but I love music, especially Bongo Fever music and Sengeli. Um, yes, I know Dula Makabila. Uh, so the idea is it is so much connect with, with the community and uh, it has this sense of power to transform and change so many things. We were involved in a project with a, with a, with a Swiss embassy on uh, using Wall Street art and 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 Sengele and Bongo Fever music to advocate for teenage pregnancy in Tandika and Sandali Street. And from the data we collected from another project, there was evidence of serious issues around teen pregnancy. The project was very efficient in terms of telling the message and engaging the local artists to advocate for the message. Where do you see, where is the role of art? Everyone has been complaining in terms of like this addiction and everything and um, people becoming machines, people not connecting to each other. Where do you see, what, is can, what, what, can, what kind of role art can play in terms of bringing back humans to humanity? Anyone who can take it doesn't have to. Um, you say, what role can art play in bringing back the human in humanity? Am I right? Yeah, sending them back to being human beings. Okay. Um, art evokes emotion. It evokes, because um, you capture a certain experience and it can transcend time and space. People feel things when they see art. They have different reactions to it, some positive, some negative. It can trigger a memory. It can trigger an emotion. So how art can bring that back is, in terms of the visual storytelling, the visual storytelling helps in triggering that emotion. I guess, in, in short, that's how art can help in that. And there's no like, light and wrong answer. Even myself, I don't know. There really isn't. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, I mean, there, there, there are many roles that uh, artists can play and that art plays. The role of the artist that I'm really interested in is the artist as observer of society who, who looks and identifies certain aspects of it or areas of interest and works out ways to communicate that to audiences in compelling ways. And you can do that by producing positive images or visions, or you can also do it by producing negative uh, visions as well. So you can take technology and new developments and you can create a kind of dystopian vision that, that wants to point out to people what the possible <coughs> negative consequences of, thing, of things are, or you can create you know, po positive images that inspire people to move in a certain direction. But I think the, the arts play a role in stimulating people, communicating issues to them, and that's what we should be good at, is activating people in that way. I can, yeah, art can play a role, but the one question that we need to also to ask ourselves, do our domain allow us, us, allow art itself to play a role by itself? Because we have a lot of issues that are happening within our society where art can respond, but do people who or lawmaker or policy maker allow it to, to happen by itself before even coming to, to fourth industrial, post industrial revolution issues, how art can you also talk about. So our domain uh, policy also is a big issue uh, that need to be addressed before even art plays the roles. Because today we have a, an amendment already passed through the parliament where uh, definition of uh, cultural, what, uh, the new amendment that already passed, they say art is free expressions. But within the same thing, Basata is also look, is also looking. It's already passed. They say Basata is to regulate, rate, uh, arrest, and what else again? A lot of things. It's more like when you do what you are criminal, 
before even you do it. So how can you uh, play a role while you're already being scared by the laws that are implemented in our parliament? I think this is something that we need to begin uh, to, to begin the dialogue out from there first, before, because you already know what can play a role, but how do, do the police allow us, the police makers allow us to do so within our domain? Since South Africa, I think you can express yourself. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, even here, by words. Arts is good yourself. as long as it doesn't touch someone who doesn't want to see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can you give me the other image? There's another interesting image, so we have to stand and look at it. So this three picture has something in common, and you guys, you are the artist. Can you help us to understand what do they have in common? Yes, is a repetition. Patterns, texture, technique. Rebecca, anything? Are they all created somehow digitally? <laughs> yeah, so actually it's an AI which drew these pictures. So let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really interesting. We actually have something at Nafasi that we call Dar Art Club, mm -hmm. and uh, we just bring up topics in art uh, and mm -hmm. debate them. And so it's about having a, a lively debate. Mm -hmm. um, and we had this question, can machines make art? And what does that mean <laughs> for us as, as the human, human species and, 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 and artists mm -hmm. um, when, when machines can make art um, and do all sorts of other things? Um, so I mean, it was a very, very lively conversation, and we, mm -hmm. we had lots of um, different differing views about this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, you know, I'll kind of going back to this this role of storytelling, um, you know, we are at this fascinating moment where humans and machines, you know, it at some point, you know, will it will it become difficult to tell kind of the difference where one ends and the other begins? Um, but I think you know, the, the question of, of authorship is the biggest one. You know, it, was there a, a person who programmed this, uh, you know, this AI to create art? And at one po what point does the, the, the machine take over in its, in its own expression? So, um, you know, the, the artist who designed the program that allowed this, you know, machine to create this art, is, are they also the, the artist or is it a co-artwork? Co I think that's a, a very interesting question. It's actually very interesting, and this, you remember we had a conversation about regulation and sandboxes and allowing innovation and creativity to happen as any regulate later. So when it comes to issues around intellectual property and everything and ownership, this will be a serious problem. And again, if you lose the steps in terms of regulation, you might limit innovation. So I don't know. But these are the challenges that technology is bringing. So it could probably even um, make sure you guys potentially lose your jobs <laughs> because that can draw. But what I really like is the fact that you said it already. Uh, there's a story behind the art, the, the message that you want to carry, the, the value you want to push, the message you want to push out there. Maybe you cannot be able to do that, but technology has reached this level. And I was also reading another article, literally uh, an AI can prepare a press release right now, so journalists are in trouble, uh, can compose songs, so music producers. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting, and these things are happening, and the changes are coming, and, and it's no longer the future, it's happening now. This is not like 30 years to come, 40 years to come, it's, it's happening now. Machines can actually draw pictures, can compose music, can prepare place releases. 
how should the artist be prepared with what is about to come? I'll start with uh, Ngaira. Um, currently, because I'm, I'm a digital artist, I, I see it more as a tool. And of course, already digital art makes drawing easier because I have all the tools I need. And moving forward, I'm sure this technology will improve. It will get to that point where I'll be able to create a piece and not even touch the pen. So the way I see it, I see it more as a tool to express what I want to express. So what I, uh, what I will do, let's say, in the next couple of years, once we have an AI uh, being able to create a piece, I can adapt to that. I'll use it as a tool to create pieces for me as well. Of course, I think that there needs to be that human element still in the expression. And uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just see it as a tool. There's no right and wrong. There's no right and wrong. <laughs> do you want to say something? Yeah. So I mean, I'd echo what Rebecca said, that I think um, people can make machines that make art, and also that um, machines can make objects that we can select as art. So, um, and also in refer reference to what you were saying about uh, machines could replace you know, music production. There's already, I think, a lot of music and art that may as well be done by machine. It's, uh, it's of, a, of, a, of a quality that means it's repetitive, it's formulaic, it's just following the same pattern as before. So I mean, it could be made by a machine. I think it calls into question again that idea of what is our role as people, uh, what are our social values. We could have a lot of uh, music and art that's made by machine unless we say, well, actually we want something better. Um, and I think we'll always be able to tell the quality in terms of, of depend depending what your standards are. As I say, I think the standards right now mean that um, we accept a lot that's not necessarily very good. So, so what, what, I what, what is better? <laughs> because for me, uh, a consumer who buys a product, I think that it might be better than that something that got it draws. So what is better? <laughs> better to who? Well, in that, in that, in that regard, I, res I definitely respect the viewer's right to go, well, I like that. You know, and, and we already have that tradition in art going back um, you know, over the last century, which is to say a urinal, that's the, that's the Marcel Duchamp example, a urinal can be art, a found object can be art, Andy Worrell said soap boxes can be art. All of those things are accepted within contemporary art as being, I look at that, I frame it, I draw your attention to it, that makes it art. And if you like it, then you like it. So that's, that, that's all fine. But um, yeah, I think that, yeah, I personally, I feel like when I was at art school and I thought, you know, shouldn't, couldn't I rather be doing something like law or medicine that would mean I'd get a job afterwards? Um, at the same time, I thought, actually, what I'm doing is really quite future proof because what I'm doing is I'm cultivating my own very human ability to make and to shape. And that is kind of one of the few areas that will remain in terms of what humans can do that like machines and computers are not as good at as we are. Anything to add, Rebecca? Or? Um, well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the digital revolution has this, it holds within it this promise of, of kind of ultimate freedom, right? And of being an equalizing force. Um, that a lot of the inequalities that have defined uh, the world and have defined um, human interaction between societies, um, it, it's, it's a new, it opens up a new frontier for a certain type of resistance and struggle um, for communities and continents that have historically been oppressed or exploited. So if you look at Africa, um, and the history of colonization, um, the history of exploitation, um, you know, one could think, okay, well, this gives us this opportunity where you have young men like the, the student we saw today who, who, you know, sees a problem and finds a solution and has access to a set of tools for free because of the internet that, you know, at one, you know, that, that he could, in some, in some ways, imagine this kind of being able to compete on a more level playing field with the rest of the world. I want to 
problematize that narrative because I think that on one hand there is that promise but on the other hand if we don't really look at that critically um, we could actually see how this technology can actually deepen inequalities um, and so you know how do we how we t how do we take that promise and make it real I think that's the the biggest question um, and I was we were having kind of a, a conversation in the in the other hall earlier um, about um, you know just how the the innovation and creativity that you see on a daily basis in African cities um, is my experience and I'm sure in, in, in rural areas as well but but the level of just sheer ingenuity that takes place in you know in some of the you know communities and places that Ralph was talking about in Kariako just in in you know all these places in Dar where Singeli was was born you know and, and Singeli is something that's you know, absolutely true to the to, to the city of, of Dar, and you couldn't it couldn't come from anywhere else, and it's absolutely you know kind of wonderful and vital and energetic. Um, so you know, I think the the question is how do we um, you know as people living in Dar es Salaam, living in these kinds of contexts, uh, really take ownership over um, the, the the creativity and the potential that we have, um, both through kind of digital you know digital technology cutting edge artificial intelligence but also what do we consider technology you know what is what is a technology technology is a is a way of, of communicating of networking of using resources in a way um, that that aids in our you know in our survival and our resilience and our ability to um, kind of uh, you know kind of imagine and shape the world as we as we want it to be and in that I think is a lot of questioning is a lot of um, asking questions uh, about, you know, kind of the structure of power and control and hopefully, you know, undermining it. And, and that's not something that only artists can do. You know, I think uh, we like to think of we being the people up here, art as having this kind of unique capacity. Um, but I think art is just something, it's, a, it's another kind of approach that anyone can have access to of just, um, you know, being creative and, and, uh, and challenging the status quo, challenging accepted notions of, um, you know, of, of what, is, what is right, what is efficient, what is good. Um, and I think, you know, that's like um, art spaces. Gadi was involved in, in um, setting up Nafasi in the, in the early days. So now it's wonderful to see a lot of spaces like innovation hubs and co-working spaces. And that's something that um, artist communities have been doing for a long time, um, just as a kind of survival tool. Speaking about innovation space, all the way there, <laughs> we, have, we have the third and the last image. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not an artist, as I said. This, this is the best thing I could ever done. Um, so I was, I, was, I was just challenging myself. If I was an artist and I was to design the next version of iPhone for Africa, what would have it look like? So I was like, okay, maybe uh, coming from Wangika, remote areas of Sengelema and Mwanza, we might need a shaving machine on the phone. Uh, we might need a malaria scanner somewhere here, uh, a thermometer, uh, a wooden case, a bamboo case, because you don't have those like plastic stuffs, solar panel because there's no electricity, uh, leather, something to check blood sugar. It's like so many stuffs. Like the design based on the actual needs. So let's, let's have this conversation as artists. Don't forget that I'm not an artist. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think you should make it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think you should look at the Japanese uh, hobby form called chindogu. And chindogu is, is uh, also called unuseless inventions. Um, because there are inventions which straddle that line between being amazing and absurd. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love the I love the shaving machine is my favorite part. Maybe you could shave. Maybe you could shave while you're talking on the phone. You would like shave your shave your chin. <laughs> like chill, chill. I'm finishing something. Chill, chill. Yeah. So so this this concept of 
user-centered design. Other people call it human-centered design, or design thinking um, for product innovation. Uh, we've just seen the, the, the recent release of iPhone. Uh, when I look at it, there's nothing about Africa on that phone. I really like the presentation of Nicholas in the morning and starting with Wakanda and the way the cities were designed, the structure of the plane, the design of the causes. I don't know who was the artist, but it was just amazing. They're all thinking and moving forward. As you say, we are moving into the 4IR generation. We want new digital solution. Africa is becoming capable. Number of countries now are producing their own cars. What is the role of the artist in terms of creativity and design and coming up with innovations that can match make with this African concept and ideas, the kind of cars we want to drive, the kind of gadget we want to carry? What does the future look like as we're becoming more capable? Uh, can, can, can I start? Uh, uh, to me, I think we have to start with uh, uh, cultural centers, or st first to, to build a bridge between educators and practitioners within the art sector itself. And the second part, we need also to uh, build another bridge between artists and in people who are in an innovati innovative sector, like, for example, hubs, uh, Costec, because few artists also get access to these people. Even people who are in the tech uh, also don't get access to, to meet with the artist, even in terms of uh, designing how their product will look at the final, because you need to reach market. That is a marketing part of it, the way it looks, how it's gonna help people, and also, artists have got that also more like it's imaginary to see even the final product before it's, it's even been made. I think the relationship between the two is still missing, mm -hmm. especially in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Other countries uh, that I've been around is there, it's still, it's growing, but here we still have that that, that gap where but, someone... But it's not, it's not the problem for Tanzania. Like, we, mm. we are, okay, digital identity can have a lot of definitions. So yeah. in this context, we don't have, like, our digital design identity. You can say, like, this, this, this is the case of the phone from Africa. Mm. Of course, you can find few printed in China. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So, love, based on your work, yeah. you're doing amazing work. Um, essay, we, we visited the mega space together, I saw some of the offers are happening there. What do you think, what, what's the law of African art in digital manufacturing and coming up with African concept and designs? Um, so, let me think, I mean, in some ways people think Africa represents the future because we, in fact, um, I mean, places like Africa have been used as testing grounds for European and American uh, e e uh, economic moves, for one thing. So sort of the neoliberal paradigm has been tried out first through groups like the IM IMF in Africa, and now in Britain and America, they're implementing it there as austerity or so on. So there's this way in which things are trialed in Africa and then taken back to the first world. But I guess one of the ways in which Africa might represent the future is because we have this big mix of kind of inequality, the heights of, of wealth and the depths of poverty. We have high technology and very low technology. Um, I, I love hybridity. So I love I love combinations and mixes. And we also are a very multicultural continent as well. So perhaps that's the source of kind of creativity and inspiration is if we can design things here that, that are reflective of that and that cater to that, that mix together the high and the low technology. So like with the work I do, it combines um, new technology, like for example, my latest project used VR sculpting tools in combination with hand wire art. So you sort of bridge these like hand processes with digital processes, you engage with street level informal artists alongside technologists in laboratories with the latest tools and you make those connections. So I think maybe Africa offers those possibilities of there are these big gaps and disparities, but if you make work that bridges them and connects them, then you can make really interesting work as a result of that. Hmm. Interesting. So this, this is my last question. Any one of you guys can take. Maybe I've been, I've, I've been kind of unfair to you. Uh, you are not expecting this. 
but I know you're artists, so you have answers for everything. Um, inclusivity, not leaving anyone behind. Some say this is like, these are sexy, trendy, top layer technologies. They're not touching people on the ground, artificial intelligence, big data, internet of things, robots, the rest of human and machine, business machine. What kind of role arts can play to bring these complex technologies and help to digest them so that it can be able to actually touch everyone, including people who are completely at the grassroots level? Anyone can take this one. Um, I can start. Uh, I think art plays a role in terms of like creating content, visual content that can showcase to literally anyone how to use these technologies. Because you, if you have a technology and you want the technology to reach a, to reach a, certain, a, a certain space, you can create visuals as in drawings, illustrations, animations, showcasing and showing how these technologies are used in, in the day-to-day, -day, um, whether it's a shaver, the, the phone shaver, or whatever technology it is. You can create the visuals that tell that story and tells that process on how to use it, which is very easy to, um, to consume. So art creates the content that is very easy and quick to consume because it's mostly visual. Um, okay, well, uh, so I, I think, you know, no matter what, even when you talk about inclusivity and access, these kind of new technologies are going to shape and influence all of our lives, um, both those who kind of are controlling and designing them and those who, who don't have that kind of, um, who aren't, who aren't giving, being given access to participate. Um, in them, and so I think you know. Of course, it is very important, um, you know, for government and you know policymakers to think about how to to create more equitable access to all sorts of education and resources. Um, but again, I would I would go back to saying, you know, this is where um, you know anyone with just an imagination, anyone with the capacity to be creative, can um, should should be looking at these these questions from a critical standpoint. So you said, you know, oh well you're artist so you have all the answer or you you'll always have an answer. I would kind of say the opposite that, you know, the artists should always have the questions. Um, and that it's really when those questions stop being asked, like, you know, who is this technology for? Who is it benefiting? Um, that's when we're really in trouble. So, yeah. <laughs> Wrapping this up, I've been given a sign that we are running out of time. So, um, any, okay, not, you're not dying, so not final words. Um, anything you want to say? <laughs> just, oh, just I, to I actually, close. I almost, I forgot that I brought a friend. Oh, please, sure. I friend, wanted to share. Share, share it with us. And uh, this connects a little bit with what, what Ralph was talking about, um, what Gadi was, uh, was, sorry, what Ngaira was showing um, in his presentation about, you know, about storytelling and where do we come from and using, you know, kind of our own experiences and our own lives um, in, in creative expression. And I really loved Ngaira's story about, you know, kind of how he became an artist and how it was a teacher of his who through, you know, the art of oral storytelling then connected that with visual art and inspired him to become an artist. And Rolf with his experiences with, with wire artists. And I think this question of value, you know, what creates value, what is valued is really important. So this um, amazing piece of artwork was made by um, an artist called Alphonse who's, who works at Nafasi. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's fascinating. It's, it is this mix of kind of, um, you know, local materials, recycled water bottles, uh, tin cans, um, all of these kind of things to create a piece that at once is very um, you know connected to, to t the Tanzanian natural world, but it's also futuristic, and you know you could you know you could build a build a robot in this, and it would be you know a really interesting piece of art. When you look at it, you know the face does look almost like a mix between a robot and an animal, mm -hmm. and so it does make us ask questions. It makes us reflect. It makes us think, um, and and really does connect to that 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 kind of culture of storytelling. 
Um, so yeah, I think that would just be what I would end on. I mean, I think you know we shouldn't wait for a big Hollywood movie to come out like Black Panther, even though I love that film. Um, you know, to remind us to value the things that you know that 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 we come from. Because if you look at that costume design and the de design of the city, that was all that all came from uh, you know African culture. But but what do we wear? What do we buy? What do we value? You know, those things. They don't have to come from outside. They can start here. We can look around at what um, what is around us. Uh, yeah. Gentlemen, anything to add, or should I give it to the panel, that to the to the to the audience? Uh, we we have time, so we are waiting for others. They are joining us in this room because this is the final panel, and and the culture of Sahara is that we cross together. So they come and join us, and then we just cross together. So I have, since they are moving to come here, we have time for one or two questions. Anyone? Yes, I see some hands. So I will start there, and then we'll come to you, brother, and then we'll go to our sister there. Anyone with an extra microphone? You can, you can actually use, you can use this one. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question uh, is about the previous picture which you have seen, the first one. Yes. Yeah. According to my understanding that uh, regarding the new technology, and uh, always new technology come with uh, more civilization. So, what I understand, uh, maybe I'm wrong or correct, <coughs> that <coughs> more civilization come, more stupid you become. And uh, you can see the example, for example, now, nowadays uh, our young brothers put trousers, we call katake, you know what I mean. And the, our sisters also, and the, our maybe our brothers uh, cut parts of their dressing to show partially their body. So this is a civilization. More civilization come, more stupid you become. And also, you can see sometime if our young sister is about married they are going to the kitchen party and this kitchen party made at the most likely at the pombe shop instead of sending the those sisters to our grandfathers who live with their life with their wife 50 years maybe in marriage i think there they can get good words instead of sending them to the kitchen party. Yeah, so can you ask like a question because these guys are waiting for a question. Yes, this is a, a question also mm -hmm. because uh, I try to make this sense mm -hmm. before question. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they already understand what I'm going to. Mm -hmm. But uh, my question is the connection of awareness between new technology and uh, uh, civilization comes to our country. Maybe this is uh, my question. Uh, first of all, we, uh, when we came to uh, technology and civilization, uh, the person who is affected here, most of it is we, actually is women. When we came to say dress, how they wear, how they eat, how they plant their hair, and all this kind of thing. But when we go back to African culture, how do we use to wear? Actually, for me, I don't have a problem with what is happening. The only thing is we are trying to act or address the culture that we don't even know. When we say Tanzanian culture, what is it? We have 142 tribals. And then before 1930s, 
back then, people used to go topless and all these kind of things. The only thing that I'm saying as an artist on my perspective is to negotiate with this. That's why even before I say it, parents and children need to negotiate. And also, they have to learn because today, kids are busy on WhatsApp, but the parent doesn't even know how to use WhatsApp or Instagram or social media. So we need to negotiate as families and within with the civilization, I think. That can be easier. Can, than, I, than can, can yeah. I make a contribution? I just wanted to say that I think it's an interesting question because there's a question of how far back we go in human civilization to get to get to the point at which we are living in harmony with nature. So I mean, the biggest thing right now is that we are destroying the planet through our technologies, but we can't go back a few hundred years and say that was a, a, a good way of being with the planet. We actually have to go back to the hunter-gatherers and the nomads because those were the people who really lived in harmony with nature. And as soon as you become a pastoralist and you start to settle in one place and you start to raise livestock, that's when things start to go wrong. So in terms of, is it, there's a book called Guns, Germs and Steel, which is about the influence of agriculture and technology on people and how human diseases all come from our raising of livestock. Um, so you have to go back a really, really long way before you get to a point at which humans are living in harmony with nature and are not making a real mess of things through their civilization. So yeah, I think we're at a position where we can't necessarily go back to that point and we probably don't want to. So we have to work out a way forward and apply our minds to how we get somewhere with where we are. That would be my perspective. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jumani. Uh, my name is Barnabas, and I have a question and also an observation. When we talk about technology, AI, and art, I see there is a direct opportunity and there is an indirect opportunity. And saying in indirect opportunities, the challenges that comes from the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and technology that we can address and have the opportunities. For example, nowadays, we have artists who have artificial, uh, uh, visual galleries. I don't know about my brother here, how does he take this uh, opportunity in technology to showcase uh, the arts? I know other places we have uh, a, a gallery that you can go in the VR, you can, you can log in, you can subscribe, and you can see, you can show, uh, an, uh, an artist can showcase the art, and people can log in and see. I don't know about you, uh, or how far you think you can go with the technology in your work. And another thing is, now that we have technologies that can replicate, we saw the pictures that our brother showed us that artificial intelligence can draw. And we have also uh, 3D printers that can, can draw anything, can, can print 3Ds. How do we Africans preserve our cultural arts? For example, the, the Vinyagos. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe one day somebody can produce 50 Vinyagos a day by just printing. But how do we preserve our, our culture, the, the, the traditional carvings and things like that? And there's another issue that uh, happens. We have uh, issues like deep, deep faking. When somebody can, can depict you in a picture or a video and uh, can use that to blackmail you or to, to disrupt your image in the society. How do we plan to protect people from the deep faking? That's all. Okay, can you repeat this? I, I had like three questions in your question. So the first one? Yeah. The first one was from my brother. How does he want how, to go far using, using the technologies okay. showcasing his uh, artworks? Okay, uh, and the second one? The second one was uh, how to protect the culture, the traditional uh, okay. arts that we have okay. against the, the one that's uh, 
emerging from the technology. And the third one was uh, protecting uh, human uh, people from the deep, deep faking. Yeah. Okay, so you have heard the questions? Uh, I will answer the one on <laughs> the online gallery. So right now, uh, you can see all of my work on all of my social media pages. So I, I, the way I, I take my social media pages, I see that as my online gallery. I see that as my, my portfolio. So whenever someone asks me, hey, where can I see your work? I give, the, I give them my social media handle. You can just vis visit the page and you will see every piece I have ever done on that page. You can also develop a website like through a website, you can create it in such a way that it literally looks like a gallery. You can go, it's like you go through a room and you see the different artworks. Um, you can also uh, collaborate with the virtual reality, where let's say I have an exhibition today and I have the venue, I can record it, and for whoever who wasn't there can experience that feeling through the virtual reality by get, wearing the, the glasses and looking around. So. There's different ways that I can use to, to portray and have that online, uh, the online gallery. Yeah. And also to add on where you said Makonde sculpture and all this kind of thing, I think technology brought a lot of things that is very positive within the art itself because uh, when we talk about climate changes, it's about cutting trees, is it? And then the Makonde sculptures is about cutting a tree. People use tree wood to, to cave, but you can use 3D printer. Before, before you cave, you just made a sketch. You can use 3D printer to, to print the sculpture that you, you want, even do a duplication of it. Then if you use how many wood will you cut to make 20 of them or 30 of them? So technology also brought positive impact into it. And also virtual reality, many artists have been, they already started using it as an, exhibi an exhibition space. And also performance, because you, like what we saw today, someone using virtual reality uh, goggles to, to paint 3D uh, painting lively, so which is very beautiful. And this is also a positive part of the, of the technology where we, 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 we embrace a lot. I think it will bring a lot into to, to the sector, yeah. I can also point out, you talked about deep fakes, where someone can take someone's face and put it in another face and it looks like it's that person. Same, yeah. So I, I read an article a couple of months maybe ago that people are developing softwares that can detect a deep fake. So let's say if you see a video, and then you are wondering, okay, is this a deep fake? There's actually people developing softwares that can detect that it is. So they're, they're looking for countermeasures for it. Yeah, so uh, there were some few more hands. It was, it was me. Hi, my name Hello, is Hello, welcome. I'm Jose. Um, I'm a co-founder of a startup company known as Artivation. We deal with selling artwork online. So what I realized was when we were doing a feasibility study and collating data for three months was that there was, I'd say like cloning or repetition of certain works. Let's say for instance, um, paintings of Maasai or like lions and Zanzibar doors. And whenever I'd ask them, they'd say like, the reason why we draw these often is because these are the pieces that sell. So I'd like to like, probably get advice from you guys like how do you tell like a person like that Bamba, that they should use their imagination to like draw and create different things well they already know that if I stick with this I'm going to get paid so how can you tell me that I should do something else and have uncertainty of like not you know yeah selling my work um. I think that, that, yeah, that question definitely relates to the area that I work in, which is to do with the wire artists who l lots of them make the same thing. And I think that um, one way of answering it, I'd say, would be to raise money to pay them to do different things. Because uh, the problem is what you're dealing with is an economic situation, of where, as you say, they're making it because that's what sells. 
and if you're really interested in intervening, then you can't really ask people who are subsistence artists to experiment uh, and potentially lose money and lose time. So actually specifically what I did in my project was raise money to pay for artists' time to work on new ideas. So it was almost like creating a form of residency for informal artists where you create spaces that they can experiment and get exposed to new influences and try out new things. So there's an economic aspect to it. And I'd also say that the situation you're describing on that small scale, um, you can almost see it in the larger sphere of, say, radio music, of where um, musician, pop musicians make music that audiences like, but what audiences like is dictated by what radio stations play, and then musicians make music to meet that demand. So it's this like circular economy in which innovation is not really rewarded. So it happens on both the small level and the, and the higher level. Yeah, um, to add to that, I can tell you an experience I had um, a couple of years ago. Uh, I interacted with this artist who displayed his art at Mwenge, and he was doing you know, the usual, the giraffes and then the lions, etc. And the way I challenged him is, first of all, I commissioned him to do a very different piece. So adding to what you said, I commissioned him to create something that he hasn't done before, and I would buy it. So the, the aim was, first of all, I was curious to see the, how, where his imag imagination would take him and what he would create. A couple of weeks later, he calls me, and I go to see the work he's done, and it's this amazing fantasy space with, like, I can't really describe it. But what's funny is I took the painting and I managed to sell it. Someone saw it. And I gave him the money and he said, oh, so people are actually interested in this. And then he started putting effort. Now, instead of doing five elephant pieces, he would do maybe four, and then one would be something of his own creation. So I sort of put that effort and, and time and money and resources into challenging him. And once he saw that there's certain results happening, he started to experiment more. Yeah, maybe, um, how many questions remain? There's one here, another one, any? Is there any other question? Only one, okay, so this is the last one. Thank you, this is the quick one. My name is Faraja Jube, I'm a photojournalist. Uh, I know you guys, you're artists, and I'd like you to take a, take a good look uh, at the three pictures. Uh, maybe one is, blindfolding, uh, that's a mobile phone, and someone who is blindfolded may uh, fall out of the way. Secondly, it's a hand chained uh, to become a slave. Mm. The third one is some sort of addiction. Yeah. Now, what do you think, where is this technological advancement will take us? Maybe down to the ditch, we become slaves, Oh, addicted, and then we, maybe we could die. From your artistic point of view, uh, maybe a quick one, you can respond it. Thank it, you. It will take us to the future that we imagine. <laughs> 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 I think <laughs> uh, it depends actually with where, where you are, how you interact with the gadgets by itself. Uh, there are people who are on the phone and by making living most of the time. They can be that way, blindfolded. They don't see any other thing. Everything is here. Either politics or social, just on their face. And there are people also, uh, as what we see, and there are people also get affected, even kids. And we can see even on social media some number of cases. But uh, the future we're imagining, we have also to be to be aware that there are circumstances that we also will have to face. And by preparing ourselves is for us to be honest with our families, our societies. What is it and what is all about? Or what is technology? So parents don't have to run away, as what I had been saying before. You have to, to come closer to your child. You're, you're, you're never home, and when you're home, you're on the phone. You don't even know who had been living with your children the whole day. You can say dad is taking care. But do you know what is happening at home? 
or what your children is also involved with. Be part of it, grow together. We, you, we know you can't use Instagram, you can't use Facebook, but try to be part of it because it's where the world is, shift, is, is shifting. Yeah, so it's a process to learn. So it's the future, we are going there. This is the result of ignorance that we are of the parents because if the parents get involved too, I think it will be in the same level, yeah. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Love. Thank you so much, Ngaira, and thank you, Gadi. Can we give them a big round of applause? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe this panel was too technical for this time. And, but it's, it's a crazy, it's, it's, a, it's a selfish me. I've struggled a lot to put this together because I had answers of myself and I just needed artists to give us those answers. Can we clap for them again? <laughs> yeah, so please, um, you can go there and maybe we will uh, just show a couple of videos that we want to show. They'll take like five or seven minutes and we can use us to